um, as set a setup to our discussion today. So um, in his short story, Young Goodman Brown, um, he really uh, goes over the top with the metaphors in this story, right? So uh, Young Goodman Brown is your average everyman, uh, hence the name Young Goodman Brown. Um, his wife's name is Faith. And Young Goodman Brown's entire narrative depends around his decision to go meet the devil in the forest just to see what it's like to hang out with the devil, maybe join up with um, a coven of witches, you know, um, just for giggles, uh, and see what happens in his future as a consequence. So again, Hawthorne really heavy handed with the metaphors here. Uh, but what's interesting about this novel, uh, about the short story and how it's relevant for us today is the way that its landscape is made particularly horrific. Um, it's a traditional Gothic landscape, right? And so it's a gloomy, wild setting, but what makes it really horrific is that it's populated with not just dense trees, but Native Americans as well. So frequently the text will note, for instance, that there may be a devilish Indian behind every tree. Um, and indeed the natives are, in, are second only to the devil himself in this story. And so we have kind of the story starting off with this, and honestly maintaining throughout, this fairly stereotypical representation of indigenous peoples as evil, as wicked and horrific creatures. And yet the story takes this weird turn very early on, or rather I should say not turn, uh, makes a weird digression fairly early on in which the devil speaking with Goodman Brown actually notes that persecution and slaughter of Native Americans becomes a sign of evil. And he says, this is how uh, that revelation appears. This is the devil speaking here. I have been as well acquainted with your family as with ever a one among the Puritans. And that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed a Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem. And it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's War. So what we see in Young Goodman Brown is an ambivalence that we see throughout a lot of Hawthorne, if I'm going to be honest, but which we also see in other American texts and particularly in other horror films. Um, and indeed, when we look at Goodman Brown, we can see how this text is guilty of ideological persecution, even as in a moment like this, it laments physical assault of Native, Native Americans, though that assault is generated by this very same ideology which marks them as devilish, as wicked. Um, and so as I said, American literature and horror film are dominated by this a very similar ambivalence, right? Um, on the one hand, it worries and shudders over a history of anti-minority violence, which it deems horrific and disdainful. But on the other hand, a lot of these texts seem to conclude that, well, they had it coming, right? So for today, we're gonna to interrogate several films from the 20th and 21st century, which really illustrate this dynamic. We'll be going on, going through Candyman just a bit, um, touching upon Amityville Horror, the remake in 2005. And then we'll spend a significant amount of time exploring Skeleton Key because the whole of this movie really exemplifies uh, the ambivalence and contradiction set out here, and which is our concern today. And we'll conclude with a little bit about uh, Steve Stephen King's a TV series, mini series version of Stephen King's novel, Bag of Bones. Uh, now, I will tell you, these are all films which I love to hate. And you will perhaps get some of that uh, energy and fever um, as I'm going through some of these. But I also want to note um, that I, I have to give you a spoiler alert. I'm going to perhaps be ruining the ending of some films for you. So just a heads up. <laughs> um, you're going to know how some of these films end, um, which, you know, you might not want to see all of them anyway. But I, I will warrant, I will say that, you know, there is um, value in watching them and understanding how America keeps coming back to the mindset it's currently in when it comes to dealing with racial difference um, and racial populations. So let's start with Candyman. 
Now, it, Candyman in many ways is a form of black exploitation films. And it really illustrates the problems with black exploitation films at their worst. Um, on the one hand, ideologically, black exploitation films were supposed to cater to an all black audience by presenting narratives, plots that uh, were of their own of concern of that minority audience, right? Um, it featured a black hero. Um, but other than that, and I, I should say the, that concern was often superficial when we actually look at black exploitation films. Um, other than that, there's not much else that necessarily that was required to make it a black exploitation film. You just need like one person of color to occupy a central uh, role, either be it as an actor, director, writer. Um, you need one person of color on camera and then the pretense of this film being about black stuff. Now at its best, uh, those black exploitation films which really aim for subversiveness um, did attempt to challenge the socio-political norms of the era. And in an article called Possessed by Soul, Generic Discontinuity in the Black Exploitation Horror Film, Stephen J. Schneider argues that miscegenation narratives in black exploitation films are meant to defy white desire to deny or repress interracial sexuality. Candyman, on the one hand, is very much focused on a narrative of interracial desire but it fails this subversive task as that desire becomes not just central to the film, but the source of its monstrosity. Indeed, we see a desire mutual between the mythical Candyman and the uh, investigator Helen, right, who invokes and pursues Candyman throughout this film. Their desire Though differently focused, you know, we get a sense from watching this film that Candyman is really into Helen. Helen just really interested in Candyman. Um, their desire is both at the center of the film and productive of its horror. And the film's conclusion suggests that their desire is consummated, given that Helen becomes a kind of Candyman figure at the end of the film. Now, uh, more problematic beyond the way in which interracial desire is made a point of horror in this film is the nature of Candyman's revenge itself. Um, while the myth of Candyman circulates among white Americans, it's African Americans in these films that truly exhibit terror. And as you proceed in watching the film, you understand why. Is that Candyman primarily attacks black folk in the ghetto, right? Candyman doesn't really attack non-blacks. Actually, Helen is the only one he engages with, and that isn't really an attack. The only people that suffer Candyman's rage is other African Americans. And this is particularly problematic when we consider the nature of Candyman's origins, which we'll see in a bit. But in terms of thinking about the terror of the Black population, we see this exhibited early on when Helen attempts to engage a Black janitor working in the university. And this janitor is terrified to speak about Candyman for fear of invoking him. Um, her friend and colleague and seeming research assistant, Bernadette, another African-American, um, is really angry when Helen jokingly invokes Candyman. And I should note that even though Bernadette had no role in invoking this monster, he's the one she killed. He, um, she's the one he kills, right? He doesn't kill the person that invoked him, which is how this myth is supposed to go. Instead, he kills the bystander. Um, Candyman, as I mentioned, largely hunts haunts the ghetto, um, particularly the impoverished Black community of Caprini Green in Chicago. And what's equally troubling is that his narrative, as we'll see in a moment, becomes strangely white owned. Not only is it told in its fullest extent uh, by white Americans in this film, I mean, even the Black janitor only touches upon parts of it, never telling the full story. Um, but Helen, the heroine's reaction to the story suggests she also claims emotional ownership of Candyman's trauma. And we'll discuss a number of ways in which uh, she 
aligns herself, well, the film aligns her with Candyman in a very problematic and su su superficial manner. Now, as we're watching this clip, I really want you to pay attention to the use of close-ups and lighting, right? Um, and pay attention to when the lighting change, um, when the sound changes, um, and who the, is the focus of that change. Um, and I'll have to beg your pardon for the unusually excessive close-ups. Uh, that's not a part of the original film where you're seeing just bits of face. Um, I did pull this clip from YouTube and so, you know, they tweaked it in order to uh, help it bypass uh, being caught. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you still get the effects, uh, the important parts of this narrative in which we really see that as the professor is recounting Candyman's narrative, the camera pans in for an extreme close up of Helen's face, the light dimming around the rest of her features, but her eyes to stress her emotional reaction to and connection to this story, right? And so we see as he's relating it, especially also with the addition of the sounds of his screams and the torture, we see her emotionally claiming this trauma as her own. Um, and what's equally problematic is it's the end of the scene as it cuts to the scene of her taking pictures of a mural of Candyman uh, in a broken down apartment in Caprete Green, right? Um, so she's also visually claiming his narrative, right? Claiming its, uh, its uh, representation from the Black community that is still tormented by this figure. Um, and so we have white appropriation of Black trauma um, at the start of this film, which is hugely problematic. But e even worse is the ways in which the film suggests that Candy Mass, all Black victims, ultimately having, have it coming, right? Um, so for instance, as Helen is investigating the story of Candyman at Caprini Green, asking the residents what they know about the story, um, she encounters a vicious drug dealer who goes by the same name, thus suggesting that there is a very real human monstrosity that populates and runs this location, right? Um, the visual form of Caprini Green uh, also implicitly indicts the community for the ruinous nature of their environment. And so in a lot of ways, this film is playing on 1980s Reagan ideologies about the welfare body, the welfare uh, mother and the welfare state, um, and is saying that these people or such people uh, produce ruin, destroy their environments, that this is not the environment that was given them. And we have further illustration of this when Helen locates uh, the blueprints for her own posh apartment complex and discovers that not only were Caprini Green and Helen's complex uh, constructed by the same architect, but the architect used the exact same blueprint, right? And it's a very weird and unnecessary detail unless we consider how that detail points a finger at the residents of Caprini Green to say, well, your place started out as luxurious and lovely as this other location, but because of you, it has fall into disrepair, ruin, and degradation. Um, and of course, we can consider how that completely ignores uh, the problem of social welfare programs and policy in providing adequately to this population um, and even recognizing them as deserving of services to help them um, sustain their life. Equally problematic, the neighbors of this community hear a mother screaming when her infant is abducted and do nothing. And so it also suggests that, you know, this population is not only controlled and uh, run by human monsters, but your average person here has no sympathy and no humanity, really. And indeed, at the end, as the community tries to rid themselves of Candyman by burning the artifacts and markers of his existence and presence among them, um, and it's a huge bonfire, huge pile, uh, Helen and the mother begin to scream that the missing infant is in the middle, still alive, of this pile. And yet, the neighbors do nothing to aid in rescuing the infant, even though the pal is now caught fire. It's Helen alone that saves the child at the cost of her life. And in doing so, not only sacrifices her life, but also becomes a monster at the end of the film.
And so what this film seems to really be warning us about and telling us is that we should not ally with such oppressed racial populations, that white Americans have no business trying to save black minorities um, because overly identify with oppressed blacks only results in, in uh, the loss of life and in your own monstrosity. Indeed, Helen in this film is marked as an ally with Candyman because she too is persecuted. And I use that word very thinly and very loosely, persecuted by white men, right? Um, her husband is a jerk who's cheating on her um, quite blatantly. Um, and we already saw the scene of the professor who was being particularly arrogant and unhelpful to her in her research, daring her to try and do something other and then demeaning her for her um, lack of complete bibliography, which again, as a grad student, as you know, it takes a while to get there and it's never really fully finished, right? Um, and so what we really see then are the ways in which uh, this film suggests that she understands Candyman because she too is a victim of white men. Mm. Um, again, not nearly in the same way, right? Another huge issue with this film. Um, at the same time, if we, if we go back to the question of her discovering the blueprints, we should also pay attention to how she reads and understands those blueprints, right? Um, because it turns out that her apartment is identical to the one in which the Candyman graffiti appears. And so she understands herself as inhabiting the same space as Candyman in this film, right? Um, but ultimately her reward for trying to ally herself uh, with oppressed African-Americans is that she becomes the monster at the end of the film. Um, her husband uh, in despair, though he was cheating on her and treating her like um, nothing the entire film, her husband in despair calls her name out three times in front of a mirror and what do you know there's burnt up bald Helen staring him back in the face ready to slice his throat right um Helen becomes the new monster right um and so this then becomes a particularly destructive message on the not just the stakes but on the supposed dangers of cross race alliances now I want to move on to a film from 2005, Amityville Horror, which is equally problematic and exemplifies uh, many of the same ideologies of Hawthorne, right? This film in some ways is about the evils of traditional patriarchy and recognizes the extent to which that patriarchal organization and dominance is built upon structures similar to racial oppression and, and in fact the same as racial oppression. So in some ways this film has a lot more subversive potential um, and moments than Candyman and I will acknowledge this does this film does have some subversive moments. Um, it is a fairly good feminist critique of patriarchy and its resolution is an attempt to dismiss the idea of feminist um, ideology and goals as being matriarchies and female dominance of the family, right? Um, so this film does a decent job when it comes to feminist ideology. It's horrible though, around the question of racial oppression and racial ideology. Now the original evil patriarch in this film is a religious zealot named Jeremiah Ketchum, right? Um, and this figure is supposedly the ultimate evil in the film, but oddly, we don't see that much of Ketchum. We start to glimpse him really towards the end of the film. What we see more so throughout the film are pictures of troublesome, horrific Native American ghosts, right? And these ghosts torment the children. Uh, they terrify them repeatedly throughout the film. And since this is our, the first time we meet the Native Americans in the film, we see them primarily as antagonistic figures. Um, the film very much sets them up as villainous rather than victims, despite what we learn later on. Um, in addition to terrifying and traumatizing the children all the time, uh, the, these indigenous ghosts attack and threaten to drown George in one bathtub scene in which they literally rip his body to shreds, right? So on the one hand, while 
their victims, they're also very much the devilish, horrific creatures that Hawthorne speaks about in Young Goodman Brown. So let's look at how the film also acknowledges the history of Native American assault and victimization at the hands of white Americans. Now I will note um, that the location, the space Jeremiah Ketchum sets up and which is talked about in this scene is alludes to the very real history and problem, not just of reservations, but also of Native American boarding schools and trying to reprogram indigenous populations. Again, the film doesn't go into detail about that, um, which is one of the, I think, shortcomings of this film. But as you're watching, pay attention, uh, especially to how this film seems to comment on the inheritance of white men, um, the role Native Americans play in that, and how it depicts them as villainous even in the moment of their victimization. Reverend Jeremiah. Some subversive potential and ideas and critiques, right? On the one hand, it does suggest that this kind of violence is the inheritance of later contemporary uh, white men, right? That they have been uh, baptized in blood and in terms of uh, their current place in America, right? That um, their current existence, privilege, uh, and prosperity is in part through this blood uh, this uh, blood inheritance of authority that is also violence, right? Um, and so you see a, a useful critique there to think about the function and organization of white masculinity. Um, also notable is how this history suggests that modern American domesticity meant both in terms of the familial space, but also in terms of the national sense is built upon this history of racial violence, right? That America is built upon, um, well, to borrow from Toni Morrison and to revise it a bit, um, there's not one bit of American ground that ain't soaked with some dead minorities grief, right? That isn't soaked with um, minority blood. Um, and so we see that played out in this film, right? In which the otherwise beautiful, welcoming domestic space is actually built on this history of horrors, this hidden horror, right? And as such, the scene really provides a counter to a pun George makes early on in the film once the family discovers that this was also their new house was the scene of um, a gruesome murder uh, some years beforehand. George puns, houses don't kill people, people kill people. But what we see based on this scene is that actually, the domestic does kill people, given the correlation between the nation and this haunting. That not only has the domestic killed people, but it encourages us to continue killing, to continue sacrificing and oppressing people. Okay. Um, so what's the film's solution? Because we know this film has a happy ending, right? Um, the film solution is ultimately to simply leave this history behind. So at the end of the film, um, Kathy manages to subdue George and decides to save him. And it, this, if you've seen the 1979 version of Amityville Horror, this is another feminist updating of the narrative, right? Um, instead of Kathy sitting in the car screaming and pleading while George goes back to the house to rescue the dog, um, in this version, uh, Kathy confronts George even in the midst of his lunatic raving and threatening to kill her. Um, she confronts him, knocks him out with the butt of the gun, drags his butt tied up to the boat, tosses him in and carries him to safety. Um, in the bottom of this boat, uh, George then awakens, right, to see his family with Kathy at the helm of the boat, um, has paused the boat and is looking back at the house. Um, in this moment, George looks at Kathy and says, don't even look at it, right? Um, and the directive there is don't look, don't think about it, leave it behind. And indeed, this is actually what happens. And again, the film in its epilogue provides us a bit more detail about the Lutz's escape. Uh, it, it, the title text notes that they didn't go back even to get their stuff, they just fled, 
All right. Um, what this suggests is a refusal to grapple with the history they've just encountered and uncovered, right? A refusal to remember and represent this history to others. Instead, the solution in this film is to re-repress it. Indeed, if you wanna say that one of the reasons the Native Americans are horrific in this film is because in the Gothic, uh, genre and in horror film in general, the reappearance of repressed history is always a point of horror, horror and thus never assumes a pretty face because it's the stuff we want to forget about. Well, then, in uh, deciding to leave that history behind to re repress it, George is essentially giving it uh, more power to assume an even more monstrous face. And yet, this is the solution. This is what brings peace at the end of the Amityville horror. Um, I'll pause here to take questions um, and to give us a brief break. Um, you can either, as Sam already noted, post questions in the chat um, or just raise your hand. I'm going to stop sharing screen. So, all right. So, skeleton key doesn't give you a break from uh, from the very start. And Philip, you might remember. I think I may have lectured on this back in uh, Bowling Green. Um, I don't remember if you were in that class, um, but from the very beginning of uh, this film, it sets up the dominant themes of isolation and threat to white innocence, right? So as we're viewing this opening clip, I want you to think about how the uh, voiceover is used to comment on both the region and uh, the Black population in this region uh, by visual shifts and visual cues. Ways in which Caroline's narrative as she reads from Treasure Island are actually, is actually being used to set up our understanding of this space and of African Americans in this space, right? Um, in this passage that's selected for this, this scene, um, it's a focus on threat to white women on a space uh, that is dangerous in part because of its illegibility, um, but also because of its isolation. And to have that voiceover interspersed with clips and shots of the bayou is to suggest that uh, Louisiana is just such a space, is this location which is treacherous and volatile um, and threatening to particularly white women's bodies, right? But also important here is the use and frequent turns back to this elderly black man, Mr. Uh, Mr. Talcott, who's just died, right? And on the one hand, while we understand him as um, an elder in a hospice home at the end of his life, um, at the same time, that voiceover also applies to him. As much as he's being read to, he's being read about, right? Um, this film is literally giving us the key for analyzing it and uh, dealing with it in its first few minutes, okay? Now, Caroline, in her, um, in her arrogance, presumes to understand the space, right? Um, she presumes, for instance, to understand what hoodoo is, claiming it's like hypnotism, right? Um, but what we see in this next scene are the ways in which that hypnotism gets extended in this film beyond hoodoo to the entire culture of the region. Now, I should note in this film um, that New Orleans in particular um, is defined as an almost entirely Black space with some white tourists mixed in, right? Um, now, of course, the reality is much different. New Orleans um, has is hyper Black, entirely Black spaces because of modern segregational politics, right? But what we also know, especially thanks to Hurricane Katrina, is that uh, there are definitely large havens of whiteness in New Orleans, um, which managed to survive the storm uh, with far less damage than we saw to the Ninth Ward, right? Um, so even the film's presentation of New Orleans as the Black space, as the location um, of a primarily Black population, reiterates it as a danger to uh, 
blonde haired, blue eyed Caroline from New Jersey, right? Now I'm gonna play this entire scene even though we're gonna talk at the moment about the end of it in which she is dancing to um, music. Um, I want you again to pay attention at the end of that scene um, to the shift in sound and soundtrack, but also again to how it uh, uses cuts and clips to suggest that she is under the sway of the entire region and culture and not just hoodoo. But also remember uh, the earlier, I want you to keep in mind uh, the earlier dialogue at the beginning of this clip between Caroline and her friend Jill pictured here, um, because we're gonna return to that dialogue a little further on. The little pun they made there at the, uh, just before Caroline gets up to dance and saying, you know, I'm 25, what's wrong with a little change given what happens in the film, right? That's, the problem is how she changes. Um, but what's also important here in this scene, as I mentioned, was the way in which it suggests she's becoming hypnotized by the culture, right? As she enters the crowd to dance, uh, the jazz music is displaced by a more hoodoo or a folk sounding music, right? Um, to suggest that that jazz is also conveying the same folk sound, which is capable of hypnotizing the white body and rendering it a passive victim. Um, but the end result of that, the threat of such hypnosis is that it will also collude with the region to claim and consume whiteness, right? And so we have interspersed with Caroline's dancing, uh, scenes of the swamp, which Jill has just told us is full of gators. In other words, things that will eat you and disappear you, right? Um, and so we have laid out in this scene, um, the threat of, uh, that which Caroline in particular is facing. Now, in addition, I should know that one of her tasks in this movie is to learn how to read the locations and its body, right? Um, this film is overly concerned with illegible bodies and illegible politics, right? And so for instance, quite often Caroline um, is confronted by Violet's uh, hostility at her being a stranger to the space. Violet says a couple of times early on that Caroline won't be able to understand her house because she's not from Louisiana. Um, when Caroline finds the hoodoo room, Violet says, you're not from the South, you won't understand, right? Um, and so what this film is also doing is playing up this um, artificial and completely erroneous notion that the North is completely innocent and unknowing about Southern racial dynamics and has no hand in it. And of course, we know this is a complete lie and falsification, right? Um, Richard Wright has, and, and, and the likes um, of Ralph Ellison, um, among many others, have showed us the ways the North is as violently racist, destructively racist as the South, just in a different kind of way, right? Um, one student some years back told me uh, the racism is of the same kind, but it, it reaches different ends. So in the South, uh, they want you near, but not too big. In the North, they want you to, they want you far away and don't care how big you are, right? Um, but it's to achieve the same end, right? Um, and so Violet's critiques of Caroline's uh, strangeness and, and um, unfamiliarity with the region is a falsification, is a fantasy of the film that at least allows some viewers to say, well, yes, and this is how I too can become a victim them as we see Caroline ultimately becoming, right? Um, Violet's house itself becomes a metaphor for the racist regional history of violence, right? And indeed, this film is very anxious over the history of racial violence. Now, I will note that this clip I'm about to show you illustrate the, illustrates the subversive potential of this movie. It could do a great deal of good in terms of articulating, naming the history of racist violence in America after the Civil War, um, well into the 20th century. Um, and for it could provide us a great deal of ways for thinking about how, how that violence and why that ideology perpetuates from generation to generation, lasts and reappears 
long beyond the time when it should have died, right? Um, but the problem is that this scene, as uh, as beautifully filmed as it is, is the only one of its kind. But as you watch, I want you to keep an eye out for a few things. I want you to keep an eye on the cinematography. Think about how um, the use of jump cuts and flashes and camera angles um, act to convey a whiteness out of control, a whiteness um, that is drunken, but also hysterical. Um, but I also want you to think about how this scene sets up the two uh, Black servants, Papa, C Papa Justify and Mama Cecile, as villainous, um, and how it positions them um, in the use of uh, editing, how it positions Cecile and Justify as the primary villains of this narrative, even as this is a story of their lynching. That was their one. For, for this crime, again, uh, this lynching takes place in the 1930s um, in this film. Um, so of course no one is punished. Um, but again, we can see in this last image, right, how this could be a subversive moment because we get a sense of how such ideologies that this violence is not only acceptable, but pleasurable passed on from generation to generation until it's continuing into the 2000s, into the next millennium. Right, um, because the children are watching this in the midst as the peak of a party. Right, this lynching occurs in a carnivalesque atmosphere to suggest it is enjoyable, it is fun. Right, um, and so although we later learn that at this point is actually Cecile and Justify who have body swapped with the children, watching their own bodies being lynched. Um, just the visual here could say a lot about how racist violence is perpetrated from era to era, right? And why we keep coming back to the same god awful places. Um, again, the jump cuts and angles in uh, this scene are useful in portraying white chaos, right? This is whiteness in the midst of hysteria and whiteness that is descending back into a savage primitive state, right? And thus at the ends, in the midst of the lynching, you have weirdly uh, the sound of African drums coming in as they string Cecile and Justify up, right? And Typically in American cinema, African drumming signifies savagery. They're playing on very well-known tropes here to make this commentary, right? And so we're to understand this is whiteness that has backslid from its proper civilized behavior and demeanor, right? Um, and indeed, the woman blowing rum on their bodies is another similar signifier, um, given that at this point, um, we associate such use and um, blowing of rum, not just with the carnival, but also with stereotypes of voodoo rituals, right? That we start the ritual, the ceremony, um, by sanctifying the altar, by blowing rum on the space, right? This appears in so many horror movies. I can't begin to name them all, right? And so that you have a white woman doing this. And it's important that it's not just a white person, it's a white woman doing this because white women were long held to be the symbol, the body of white civilization and the sanctity of white civilization, right? Um, if you look at imperialist uh, narratives and discourses uh, from the 19th century, uh, what we see is this notion of the white woman as the body of the uh, modern society, and thus she is saintly, right? She is a sanctified body, an untouchable body. Um, Britain in particular plays upon this um, with uh, Britannia, the image of Britannia, right? Um, but this is a whiteness then that has lost that restraint. Now we can talk about in the Q&A if you like, on um, the significance that uh, this white crowd are also Creoles and how that inherently renders them less than white um, in the ideas, in the mind of uh, your average European. And we can talk about that history there. Um, I shouldn't just say European, your average American, right? Um, because indeed, when we talk about 
the South and when we talk about spaces like New Orleans in particular, we talk about them as special places populated by special people, right? Be they white or black. Um, and so whiteness does accrue some degree of difference in part because of its location, right? And this film plays upon that history as well. Um, but the problem in this history, in this narrative's vision of the history, are the ways in which Cecile and Justify, even though they are the victims of the lynching, are also set up at the very beginning of the scene as villainous, right? And it's done, again, through jump cuts um, and color palette. It's, that scene introducing Cecile and Justify um, is somewhat dis dizzying and disorienting. Uh, they appear in different places as if they're specters, as if they're ghosts already, right? Um, they're haunting figures that stare uh, without any uh, hesitation into the camera, right? They confront the audience with a kind of power in their gaze uh, that's disruptive. Also important there is the, uh, the way their bodies are positioned, right? They stand upright, bold, and strong, despite the fact that they are servants in a house and as such, especially in the 1930s, oppressed submissive figures, right? Their, the figuration of their body and their introduction to them in the scene posits them as servants that serve no one but themselves, that are ultimately more powerful even than their masters. Now I mentioned uh, they're the villains of this film because, well, they, what we learn is that they've been going around stealing white bodies, right? They don't just stop at the Thorpe children uh, once their bodies are stolen from them and lynched. Um, but having abducted the Thorpe children's bodies, they then go on as each body ages to abduct other white people's bodies and claim them as their own, right? And so Cecile and Justify are the ultimate body snatchers. Um, even though Cecile complains about not being able to get a black body, that complaint, as humorous as it is, is also telling because it tells us that they've only abducted white bodies, right? And so what we're confronting is a narrative of black usurpation of white life, of white authority, white privilege, um, of white wealth. Now equally problematic is what Cecile and Justify do with all of that privilege, power, and authority once they steal it, right? Um, you would think as the Thorpe, as now the Thorpe children, you know, they're inheritors to a fortune. They should live the good life. They should be masters by now, right? Wealthy, living in luxury. But what we see in this film is that by the time Caroline enters the home, the house has become ruinous. It's no longer the beautiful mansion it was under Thorpe's rule, right? Um, it's fallen into extreme decay and disrepair. Um, has leaky ceilings, uh, stained floors, windows that don't function. Um, what we also learn is that upon this moment of body snatching uh, that Thorpe also falls into ruin. Now Thorpe is a banker, but shortly after the Cecile is justify, uh, I guess, usurp his children's bodies, his bank falls into ruin. He loses his wealth, okay? Um, his wife commits suicide and shoots herself. Um, so essentially what this film is arguing is, black, is that black usurpation of white authority doesn't simply bring uh, black power and agency and rule, but rather it brings ruination that blacks, once they get into power, ruin things, right? And if that doesn't sound like all the anxiety about Obama's um, presidency as he, once he was first elected, I don't know what does, right? But we can see how popular culture has been projecting and feeding us those fears and narratives that those fears are proper, that this is, in, of course, what you should be afraid of, right? Also notable are the ways in which Cecile and Justify are also uh, horrific influences on children and attack children, 
similar to what we see in Amityville, right? So uh, these two images come from the same scene. Uh, in the first, Caroline finds this picture of the two Thorpe children alone. But beneath it is the second picture of Cecile and Justify with the Thorpe children. And what's important here is the different uh, facial expressions of the children. On their own, they are happy, normal kids. They smile, they seem innocent, they seem young. Uh, with Cecile and Justify, you no longer have those pretensions of happiness, right? Uh, they don't dare to smile. Rather, they almost uh, glare at the camera with a kind of unhappiness and resignation. Also important there are the ways in which Cecile and Justify dominate the children in that moment. Uh, Cecile frames and borders uh, the child's body with her hand while Justify's arm reaches just past the other, the young boy's body, right? And so the two children are, utter, are utterly contained and overwhelmed by these two black servants, which are su supposed to be submissive to them, but which ultimately, uh, who ultimately steal their bodies and their futures. Now, in trying to think about how this film could render the victims of a lynching the villains of the narrative, it's important for us uh, to make note of the director's own commentary in one of the DVD extras. Um, and the DVD for this film has marvelous um, extras that are really worth reviewing. Um, the director, however, in talking about this film and talking about Cecile and Justifies lynching, terms it a small crime. Like those are his words. He terms, he calls a lynching a small crime, which is really both mystifying and upsetting, right? Um, but really, what that also tells us is how then he can interpret Cecile and Justify's desire for vengeance and their understandable rage, um, how he then can interpret that as villainy, right? Um, because if what was done to them was just a small crime, then their continued theft of white bodies is an excessive reaction to a minor, minor moment in history, okay? Uh, but equally important, as much as Cecile and Justify are the villains of the film, they're not the only villains of this film, right? Um, and again, I want you to, this is where that opening conversation between Caroline and Jill are, is particularly important, right? The film sets up other Black figures, uh, Black women in particular, as equally problematic. Um, and so uh, in that scene, Caroline and indicts the nurses for failing to show the kind of humanity and sympathy that's expected of, well, your average person, much less a nurse. Um, I should add in there, failing to show also decency. Um, so in that scene, Caroline notes that uh, to Jill that the second he, Mr. Talcott died, it was like they couldn't wait to get him out of there. It's just a business to them, all right? Um, in other words, that what should be about human connection and vitality and caring is denied any human emo emotion and reduced down to just capital by the very people that are responsible for caring, right? Jill responds, it is a business, but at least he had you, right? So Jill reiterates the Black perspective. This is industry. We're not supposed to get attached, right? Uh, to which Caroline counters, no, it's supposed to be a business about caring. They couldn't care less. So in other words, uh, not only are the nurses uncaring and inhumane when it is quite possible to marry and weld industry to humanity. This is what a hospice is supposed to be about, right? Um, and these black nurses refuse to do that. Not only are they guilty of being inhumane and unsympathetic, they're also negligent in their job, right? They fail to show any kind of decency as such. Um, and what we discover, as Caroline later explains to Jill, is that this becomes criminal, right? So in trying to explain to Jill why she's, Caroline really wants to save and needs to save Ben, uh, she explains, if I'm not attached to him, I'm abandoning him. 
right? Which again, negligence of the elderly is a crime in America. Um, as such, the nurses are also guilty of abandoning patients, are, are guilty of negligence because of their refusal to form any kind of emotional attachment to show any kind of sympathy. It's not just the nurses that are the problem though, right? Uh, early on as Caroline is waiting to give Mr. Talcott's remaining items to his family, we discovered that the family never shows up. And so the family has also abandoned their own ancestor, their father, their grandfather, their husband, uh, their uncle, right? So this isn't just a problem of black nurses, this is a problem of blackness in the, the film says, uh, that there is no sense of connection, community, sympathy and humanity. And what Caroline sees when she goes to finally toss Talcott's box in the trash is that there's a number of other boxes in that trash, quite a few, right? To suggest that this is a recurrent issue, that Black folk abandon their own, show no love or care for their own, right? So again, like Hawthorne's Native Americans, um, like the Black populace of Caprini Green and Candyman, uh, the violence that comes to Cecile and Justify, the narrative argues is deserved. They had it coming. Now, the other problem in this film is it's a, the illegibility of the location, that the bayou is rendered utterly unreadable and the consequence is profound threat to Caroline because the bayou is largely populated by a miscegenated population. Right. And so in the smaller picture on the right hand side, what we right hand side, we see what seems to be a, a white elderly woman accompanied by a young black woman, perhaps a caretaker. But what we ultimately discover through Violet and uh, Violet, who is Cecile and Luke, who is Justify's narrative, is that this white woman might actually be a black woman passing as white. Right. So this film also plays upon anxieties about passing in addition to everything else, All right? Um, but equally illustrative of the threats of an illegible body and an illegible population, um, equally illustrative of this is uh, the scene in which Caroline first stops to get to gas and encounters this very peculiar gas station. Now I should note, this isn't the only scene like this in the film, there's others, for instance, she has a similar strange incident in a laundromat, which is also doubling as a hoodoo par parlor, strangely. Um, so this, this scene is really an example of, again, a consistent pattern in this film and a consistent pattern of concerns. As you watch, again, look for cues that this station is utterly, not just illegible, but also illogical. And as a consequence of both, a threat to Caroline's innocent whiteness. Here, actually, there's quite a few things that play in this scene. Uh, one are the ways in which, again, black ownership of uh, a business of a space in which we expect a normative economic exchange to occur. Um, black ownership makes that space ruinous, alien, um, and peculiar. Right? Um, the gas station is not just a gas station anymore. Instead, it's also a home. Instead, it's also apparently the space of hoodoo worship, given the record playing in the background and the bones hanging from the ceiling. Um, additionally, the brick dust at the front of the station in front of the door also suggests that it's also a space where there might be some nefarious dealings because as we learn later on, uh, hoodooists use brick dust in order to stop people who would do them harm from entering a space, right? Um, but why do you do that unless you have enemies? Um, and so the setup of this gas station calls us to question what actually goes on here? Who enters, who occupies and owns this space? It's a gas station that's no longer a proper orderly functioning gas station. 
right? Um, and like the house, it's also run down and disheveled to a peculiar moment. Um, we have the sense of it as literally decaying thanks to the flies buzzing about, right? So again, Black ownership doesn't bring wealth or even a continuation of the same orderly industry. It brings ruination. Um, Equally important here, uh, Caroline again confronts the problem of an illegible body in the white woman, the elderly white woman, or rather the Creole woman that appears at the door. Um, but in turning around, we see this what's at stake in not being able to read and understand her location. It's the stake is actual death. Right, um, and it's important that in turning around when uh, the gas station attendant pulls out the knife, we hear it swing, right? To emphasize in for just a brief moment that this knife could cut her to pieces, right? It could be used in a number of ways. And in that brief second, we're not sure what way it's gonna be used for and neither is Caroline. Equally important is the fact that she can't speak the language, that she can't speak Creole. And Creole itself is a kind of miscegenated language, part French, part African, and part dialect, right? Part English dialect, right? Um, as such, it's impossible for someone outside of that system who does not know Creole to engage, to understand it, right? Um, and as such, it's is another way in which Caroline is prevented from locating and properly defining and navigating the culture and spaces around her. She literally cannot speak or understand its stories, okay? Um, the function of hoodoo itself is another important part of understanding the threat of miscegenation, given the kind of power and potential hoodoo claims. Now, this isn't the actual uh, definition of hoodoo, but this is the definition which the film provides for hoodoo, right? Jill explains to Caroline that hoodoo is primarily folk magic divorced from religion. It's part African, part Native American, part European. It's thus a miscegenated form of power without any ethical or moral rules or boundaries because it has no organizing system of authority. Um, hoodoo is a power that claims what it will, when it will. But equally important here are the ways in which, again, two uh, racial forms of culture, right? African part, African part, Native American, also corrupt a European power, right? Because it's also part European. That hoodoo depends upon the interplay of all three uh, to the corruption of the last of those three parts, right? Uh, this question of being unable to recognize and locate its oneself within the culture and region, lastly, also appears in the house in terms of the missing mirrors, right? Violet takes down all the mirrors of the home. Um, and in doing so, creates a space which is destabilizing to Caroline in particular as a space in which she is denied the ability to recognize and locate and situate herself, right? She's not able to literally put her face together through the use of mirrors in the morning. And thus uh, the absence of mirrors destabilizes her sense of self. But I would argue that the missing mirrors merely reiterate what the entire region, according to this film does, which is dislocate and destabilize the sense of self um, so that you are in danger ultimately of losing yourself, not just through body snatching, but through a kind of cultural influence, miscegenating cultural influence, right? So what's the moral of Skeleton Key? What does it teach us as an audience? Well, similar to Candyman, it's a warning against having too much sympathy for a race for oppressed racial populations, right? Caroline becomes a victim because of her big heart, not because of any inherent villainy, because she is too trusting, right? And fails to keep uh, people of color at arm's length, that she's willing to become attached regardless of age or race, right? And the story says this is ultimately her downfall because even the black population knows they can't be trusted and thus keep each other 
at arm's length, right? Um, so again, this is another anti-alliance narrative uh, that we need to be wary of, especially as we go forward um, in the 21st century. Now I'll pause here for another break and another Q&A session. Um, I also wanna, before we go into the uh, Q&A over a skeleton key, I wanna issue a trigger warning for the next session section because it includes quite a bit of discussion of rape that um, is a bit difficult. Um, so again, please be advised, uh, we will be talking about even, uh, not that litching was easy subject matter, um, but we'll be talking about other really difficult subject matter in the next section in Bag of Bones. Um, so yeah, let's pause here for a break and for some more questions. Now, Bag of Bones is particularly vile to me given the history of sexual assaults on black women. Bag of Bones is a TV miniseries that was based on Stephen King's award-winning novel by the same name. Um, and the fact that the novel won awards is really distressing to me. Um, I merely I have not read the novel having seen the miniseries. I refuse to do myself that kind of uh, extended harm. Um, but uh, and you'll see how this this uh, narrative is particularly terrible. Um, so thinking about the history of sexual assault on black women, well into the 20th century, white men were not prosecuted for raping black women. The reason was the presumption of supposed black female hypersexuality. Um, it was popularly believed that all black women were wanting sex all the time, anytime from whoever they could get it. So how can you rape someone that ultimately really wants it even if she's saying no and finding you tooth and nail to stop you from assaulting her? Um, if anything, white rapists were perceived as victims of black women's seductive lascivious natures. Um, and so for instance, uh, in early films, uh, one of the threats of the mulatto, of the tragic, well, she's not tragic, of the lascivious mulatto who was also a Jezebel, was that she would seduce white men into sexual misdeeds and into all uh, other criminal um, and cultural behavior. And so again, uh, white rapists argued, well, she lured me into it. She tempted me, she wanted me to do this. Uh, well into the 1960s, Black women rarely received justice for their rapes, and I would argue uh, they still don't really receive justice, um, not nearly um, in the numbers they should, given the number of incidents. Um, and this is apparent in fiction like Richard Wright's uh, novel, Native Son. Um, and again, this is a hugely problematic novel, as critical and groundbreaking as it is, but in terms of gender politics, Richard Wright's got issues. Um, but what's interesting is his the moment in which Bigger rapes his girlfriend, rapes and murders his girlfriend, Mary, right? Um, he uh, brutally violates her and then tosses her body down an alleyway where it's left uncovered and uncommented on. She literally disappears from the narrative at this point. Um, and into the 1960s, Black women were treated much the same way that Mary's body is treated in Native Son. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver in Soul on Ice even notes that he practiced raping black women before he moved on to white women and he wasn't prosecuted for his assaults on black women um, because clearly it's only the white ones that mattered. Um, and he is equally dismissive of black women in terms of thinking about the violence he visits upon them. A 1968 study of policing in Philadelphia found that police were slow to charge for rapes against black women, um, primarily because of a lack of confidence in the veracity of black complaints and, and a belief in the myth of black promiscuity, right? Um, so well through the 60s um, and uh, even later, uh, you have a lack of prosecution and justice for uh, black rape victims. And the reason I mention this is because Sarah Tidwell is one such black rape victim. And yet she's made the supreme villain of the film. Um, indeed, she's the source of the curse on the town and particularly on the men of the town, right? So having been brutally raped and watched her daughter drown to death by the group of men that gang rape her, um, she curses them that they will do to their daughters what 
they have done to hers, right? Um, and again, this is a woman that has just suffered a supreme trauma, two supreme traumas, gang rape, followed by the murder of her child. We should be sympathetic towards her rage. And yet this rage is turned into monstrosity in the film's narrative. Um, and ultimately Tidwell, not the fathers that do the drowning, but Sarah Tidwell is blamed for the death of innocent white girls. Um, Kira, uh, one of the girls in Jeopardy blames Tidwell for her father's attempt to kill her. Um, she also defines Tidwell as the mad lady, right? And talking about a dream she had of Tidwell at a carnival. And it's important that Sarah, not Sarah, that Kira uses this word mad to describe Sarah, right? Mad both in the sense of being angry, but also mad in the sense of being insane, right? Of being a lunatic. And if we consider the extent to which, you know, uh, insanity itself is, tip is often treated as a form of monstrosity, um, a source of subhumanity um, in many cult in American culture, um, to call Tidwell mad is again to call her lesser, other, uh, not quite human. Um, the scene of Tidwell's rape is also a profoundly othering um, and renders her more villainous than a victim, even as she's being sexually assaulted, right? Um, so while Devor rapes her, she laughs at him, insults him, and makes jokes about his penis size while he's violating her, right? Uh, Tidwell only cries when her daughter is threatened and while they're threatening and as they're drowning, her daughter, um, which suggests at least some degree of motherly instinct. But importantly, her motherly instinct does not and cannot protect her child. Instead, her motherly instinct is damning and curses and destroys other daughters. All right. Um, and so what we see in the film is that as Tidwell's daughter is drowned, she screams out, help, I'm drowned, and the ing is cut off. Um, as uh, Devor's horde uh, submerges uh, the daughter again under, under the water, young Keisha under the water, right? Uh, Keisha's plea is echoed in the screams of the first girl in the tub, right? To suggest, again, this is Tidwell doing this violence, not the father. So in addition to this horrific presentation of a victim, to in addition to victim blaming, which is all that this film especially is doing. Um, the other huge problem is the film's solution to this history of violence, to Tidwell's curse, right? And the solution to this history is much like Amityville horror, except taken up a notch, right? Amityville says, don't look at it, forget about it, repress it. Uh, Stephen King says, erase it altogether. Okay, um, so as a writer, Mike, the hero of the story, is faced with a vicious bout of writer's block after his wife Joe dies. And so you would think, as a writer in search of a story, he's occupying this haunted cabin uh, who is haunted by a ghost that is created by this horrific history. There's your story. Tell Tidwell's story. Does Mike do that? Well, of course not, all right? Um, instead, Mike repeatedly destroys Tidwell's voice. So for instance, um, in uh, the scene on the left, in the smaller scene, um, Tidwell's voice appears twice over, right? Mike returns to his wrecked cabin and it hasn't been wrecked by Tidwell. Uh, Devor's goons have been in and tossed the place. Um, but once Mike returns home, the tablet starts playing and it's a video of Tidwell singing, right? And as the tablet plays, the record player starts up and on the record is Tidwell's voice saying, I'm right there with you, baby, right? So in that moment, Tidwell's also expressing solidarity. Like, look, these same idiots assaulted me. You are subject, you are prey to the same villains. I'm right there with you. What, how does Mike respond? He picks up the record, calls out Sarah's name, right? Recognizes this as Sarah's voice and then destroys the record, 
this is just a smaller version of the ultimate solution uh, to the film, which I'm about to play for you. Uh, please note that the, what, I, what Mike has there in his hand is a bag of lie. There is not just that the lie erases all evidence of Tidwell and Keisha um, and thus erases the history um, their bodies represent, but that lie is also a white, white substance, right? So this is a moment of actual whitewashing of history, right? That it's they're covered over with whiteness. Um, also important in this scene is the refusal to accept any responsibility for this history of violence, right? Joe says, they did, Mike had no role in this. He's not responsible. Um, to which Tidwell counters, but he, his kin killed my daughter, right? So in other words, his people are responsible. And thus, so is he, that he is the inheritor of a system born out of violence. And so he was responsible to fix this. There's no counter to this, right? The solution isn't to address the issue, isn't to um, make any kind of reparations, but to erase it and say, well, I just inherited this, not my fault, sorry, right? I can say sorry, but I don't have to do anything else beyond saying, I'm sorry. Okay, so again, the, the ending is particularly heinous, given that, you know, this entire narrative has done profound ideological violence um, to black women and to rape victims and to uh, folks that have, that have suffered this history of violence. Now, why does this matter? How does this connect to our contemporary moment? I touched upon this already um, in the Q&A, um, but again, uh, in terms of the recent um, explosion of anti-Black violence um, by police, right? But also in terms of the treatment of Black Lives Matter protesters versus the Trump rioters who were literally in the act of committing multiple crimes. Not only did they storm the Capitol, which is a crime, but they also were preparing to take senators hostage and apparently lynch uh, Mike Pence, right? And yes, what do we see in terms of police response to these two different groups? Black Lives Matter, they come in guns drawn, firing rubber bullets and tear gas, right? Uh, the Trump, the MAGA riots, they escort them in. Uh, they provide uh, background aid, right? At most, I mean, we have the narratives of the one um, black police officer who led the rioters on a chase and uh, distracted them from their actual goal, right? Led them away from senators. Um, my question is, given the response to the Black Lives Matter protests, why was he having to play the role of Bates? Why didn't we see the same kind of show of force even before they got inside the Capitol? Why were the police at their back doing nothing to subdue these rioters? My argument is it's because we have been digesting narratives such as the ones we've discussed today, which teach us that while Black Lives Matter uh, protesters may be protesting peacefully, may be trying to argue for the sanctity of Black life, um, saying that it's as it's equal to the sanctity of white life and thus should be respected and protected, um, that they're nonetheless treated as criminals, that our allies are treated as criminals, as uh, less than citizens, as other, right? Um, because of these narratives, because even having confronted, as we've seen in multiple films uh, from today, even as we acknowledge, well, yeah, what we did was really wrong, well, we don't really have to do anything about it. Right. Um, so for the Black Lives Matter protesters to call us to do something about it, well, that's an assault. That needs to be handled and reacted to with extreme violence. Right. Um, whereas the MAGA rioters, well, you know, they're not doing anything but exercising their rights as citizens with a little bit of extra zeal. Right. Um, the profound difference in the response to these two
these particular uh, protests and riots um, really it illustrates uh, the impact of the kinds of ideologies that are being transmitted to us um, in films like these. And I should say it's not just in horror film, um, it's throughout other areas of popular culture as well. Um, so I'll end there um, and I'll take uh, final questions for uh, the last bit of the session. <laughs> 